when I working in progress. Um, so the I think so that's a fairly recent one over there. Does anybody know what the without looking? You can do it without looking. Does anybody know what those four that are still represented with the placeholder names over there are? I don't even have the, the order memorized, but I can I'm pretty sure I can get the right. right? Muscovium, named for Moscow because it was discovered in Russia. There's Nihonium, which is discovered in Japan. It's the only element named after anything from Asia. Um, all the rest of the elements are named after towns, people, et cetera, um, from, from Europe or North America. Um, so Muscovium, Nihonium, Ogainsen. Ogainsen is just like Seaborgium, where it's named after one guy whose group found a whole bunch of elements before that. Um, so Ogainsen, I know, is the one that's Ogain is in is the noble gas, it's column 18 on the far right. And then the one next to that is Tennessee, named after Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where the Manhattan Project did most a sizable chunk of their uranium refining for um, during World War II. So use those names, not um, not the placeholder names was the point there before I got distracted. Uh, and then, so if we could go ahead and start by pulling up a spreadsheet program. Um, if you have, if you're all using Chromebooks, then that's probably Google Sheets. I'm gonna keep saying Excel because it's habit. It's the only spreadsheet program I used for 20 years, but go ahead. Our, the LT, uh, LTUSB automatically, our emails automatically give us Microsoft, so. They do, but only the online version of Word, right, or of uh, Excel, which will change the way some of the buttons look as well. So either Excel or Sheets, either one of them will work. If you have a full-on um, laptop that has the downloaded version of Excel, that's ideal because some of the formatting gets finicky for the online version of Excel and and for Sheets, um, when you're especially when you're trying to plot data. And the formulas might look a little different. There's a few places where Sheets uses a semicolon instead of a comma for formulas and things like that. Um, but other than that, any spreadsheet program should work. All right, so we're going. I'll use stick to using the online version of Excel as well, so everything looks the same. And it doesn't want to let me do that. Go through the portal then. All right. So while I'm pulling that up, if everybody can go ahead and start by um, making up some data, we're basically going to. This is um, the reason I'm having you do these calculations in particular is because this is also very similar to the way your grades are calculated in this class. Mm -hmm where it's a weighted average of different categories. It's not based on raw number of points. And so we're going to go through some fake, we're gonna make up some fake data, some fake grades for some fictitious, fictitious students. Um, so you can go ahead and start by making up five people's names. Um, please don't use other people that are in the classroom because you're gonna to have to give them grades and whatever. Um, I guess it matters more if I do that since my calculations are up on the screen, but. Make up five names and then start making up some scores for, for uh, I think it says three homework assignments, three quizzes, and an exam grade. So start just start filling that in, typing that in while I pull up uh, my and if at any time I'm getting ahead of where you are or you don't even need to know how to get to where I am, um, please. Let me know, stop me, ask the people around you. So if you're starting from the very, very beginning, when you first pull up a spreadsheet program, open up a blank sheet and you should just get a bunch of boxes. Um, one like that. Yeah. I can try. USB C. 
that should that's a USB C, I think. I don't know whose it is, but you're welcome to try it. All right. So I'm going to start at the very beginning for people who have never done anything with spreadsheets. If you feel like you know what you're doing, go ahead and follow along the instructions. You can move ahead, work ahead, see how far you can get. Um, if you get stuck, just hang on there and wait for me to catch up and then follow along with what I'm doing. Um, so these spreadsheets are really, really powerful for a few reasons. Um, the thing that they do best is repetitive calculations. If you have to do the same calculation a whole bunch of times in a row, spreadsheets is what you're going to want to use, right? And so the way that you keep track of where stuff is in spreadsheets, let me see if I can, um, is basically by using the rows and the columns. Make sure I get that over there. There we go. Um, and where you just refer to to an, a rows and rows and columns, or I guess it's columns and then rows in spreadsheets, um, just like you would use X and Y coordinates. So B1, B is the second column, one is the first row. So B1 is that cell right there that the cursor is highlighting. All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and start filling in some, some students and some grades. And just making stuff up. We'll go with the stones today. Um, I don't know. Mick Jagger seems like he does his homework probably more than Keith Richards does. So we'll go with. Don't get me wrong, I like I love Keith Richards, but I'm not sure he's good at turning in assignments on time. Charlie Watts obviously is the best at turning things in on time. And Brian Jones, uh, he does pretty good and then he drops off. Mm, I don't know. And exam scores, none of them are very good at tests. Let's be real. All right, so I have some fake numbers. Hopefully you also have some fake numbers. Um, the next step that the, calc that the uh, assignment has you working on is it says we're going to fill up names. We'll do a series of calculations. So next columns, we're going to do quiz points, quiz percent, homework points, homework percent, and final grade. All right, so we're just going to start. When you type letters or symbols other than numbers into an Excel, into a, they call every box is known as a cell, hence the name Excel. Uh -huh. Um, you know, Microsoft in the early nineties was thought they were very clever. Um, when you type numbers into a, into a cell, um, it treats them like numbers and you can do math with them. If you type letters or symbols like percentages or try to put units to your numbers or dollar signs or things like that, Excel gets confused doesn't really know how to handle it. So typically we're gonna label things by labeling the column. And then when we put numbers in, we're not gonna put any, any units with them. We just do our units by labeling the columns themselves. So if I was being really careful here, instead of just writing quiz three, I would write in parentheses, I would label what my units are. But since everything in this case is gonna be points, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. Um, what you don't wanna do is type eight points. See how when I do that, it moves all the way to the far left of the cell. 
that tells you it's treating that like it's just text. It's not going to let you do any sort of math with that. So anytime when we do Excel, when we do any work with spreadsheets, um, make sure that you put your units in a separate cell than your numbers, than your values. So, and keyboard shortcuts are also super helpful with Excel. Um, if you if you hit tab instead of enter, it moves to the right instead of moving down. Um, control and the arrows is a pretty good way for moving to the other end of a bunch of data. See, I can make the cursor jump from one end to the other. Um, works with up and down as well. Shift and arrows lets you select more than one cell at a time. There's a lot of good keyboard shortcuts. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with them now. But if you're wondering how I'm doing certain um, how I'm moving the cursor around so quickly, that's probably what I'm doing. Not nearly as cool um, as I think it is. I realize that you haven't seen the power of it yet. You don't know how cool keyboard shortcuts are yet necessarily. But trust me. Uh, quiz points and quiz percentage. All right. So if we wanted to add up our first student's points, your numbers don't have to match mine. In fact, they probably shouldn't match mine. You're making up your own numbers, right? If we wanted to, to add up their points, we could just have Excel do the math for us. Um, we, we could do it on a calculator and put in the points by hand. We could pull out our calculator and say, okay, it's nine plus eight plus nine, and type in, was that 26? Um, or we can, if we want Excel to do math for us, you start by typing an equal sign. And so when you tell, when you start with an equal sign, that tells the program, whether you're using Sheets or Excel, that you're gonna, that you're gonna ask it to do some, either some math or call a program of some sort call up a function. So if you forget, if you try to do math in Excel and you don't start with an equal sign, it'll just treat it like it's text. But if you start with an equal sign, then you can do things like nine plus eight plus nine, and it gives you 26. I missed by one. And go away. In fact, can we minimize this even? There we go. Don't need to see that. Um, but even better than that, the problem with, with just typing in like that um, is that let's say that Mick comes back and successfully argues for two points on homework two. Um, and so he actually gets a 10 out of 10 on homework two. So I'm going to go and back and change that to a 10. But that doesn't fix this, then I have to go back and adjust this by hand as well, right? One of the ways that Excel is really helpful is that if you, let me put this back to an eight for now, if instead of typing in the numbers by hand, if you actually reference the cells that hold the numbers, you can just say whatever number is in, what is in C3, add that to D3 and to E3. So and you can either type C3, D3, and E3, or you can either you can click on the cell C3, and it'll do that for you. All right, so I'll go back, look at the formula here. I typed in equals to tell it I want to do some math, and then instead of typing in nine, I clicked on the cell that the nine was in for first homework one and then homework two, and then homework three. Gives me the same answer. Why does that matter? Because now when I come back, if I go back and give Mick his last two points here, it automatically changes the 26 to a 28 for me. Well, that sounds, that sounds pretty useful, right? That's a good place to start. The other thing that's really helpful is if you copy and paste the formulas, it'll adjust what cells it's referring to. So if I copy this formula, if I just use control C, if I put the, the green cursor on the, the cell that has the formula in it, and I hit control C, it gives me the little, back when I first learned computers, back in the, the days of the black screen with right, white writing, Oregon Trail, 
They called those the marching ants. Um, when you had this going on, you have the marching ants when you hit copy that cell. If you, if you select all the cells where you're going to do that same math and hit paste, control V, it pastes the same formula there, but instead of being C3, D3 plus E3, I moved down one cell. So it shifts down from being C3 to being C4, right? So you really only have to code the function, the, the math once. You do the math once and copy and paste it, and you can do it for all of your data points. It doesn't matter if it's four or if there's 4,000 data points. You write the function once, you copy and paste it, it does all the math for you. Four data points, is it really that much faster to do it this way? Maybe a little bit if you're really good at Excel, but when you, when you get past about 10 data points, you really don't wanna have to do it by hand, right? This is how you avoid doing it by hand. All right, um, I guess, and I think I skipped a step two from the instructions because it has you do a total points possible, right? So I already mentioned that when I do, when I do um, assignments, everything's either out of 10 points or 100 points, but it doesn't really matter for the sake of this assignment. If you want to make your one of your homework assignments out of 20 instead of out of 10, that's fine. That'll still work just as well. In fact, it might even work better as far as having, you know, your data will look a little bit different. Um, but I'm just going to fill in my points possible. I guess I should call it points possible, not total. And then my exam's out of 100, but if you made your exam out of 120 or 200 or something like that, you could use, do that as well. So how many, and then if we copy and pasted the formula one more time, the other way you can copy and paste the formula. So you can, you can do control C or right click on it and go to copy and then, and select all the, everything and paste it. Um, if you're pulling it down for an entire column of data and it's not that big of a column, you can, if you hover your cursor over the bottom right corner where there's that little box, your cursor turns from this being this little white plus sign to being a black plus sign. Now, if you drag that down, it copy and pastes for you. Save you a couple of keystrokes if you do that. That doesn't really work if you've got a data set of 4,000 data points though, because you don't wanna click and drag and drag and drag and drag and drag all the way down to page 72 where your data set ends. Um, in which case using the keyboard shortcuts and the arrow keys to get around is probably faster. Um, plus I try to avoid using the mouse whenever possible because I type pretty well. Not that well, I, I do Excel typing. I spent a lot of years in Excel um, when I was in grad school. All right, so if we wanna know what, how many points possible or what the homework, sorry, the um, percentage for each student in the homework category. What's the formula for finding percentage? We haven't done that very much yet, but what is it? Parts divided by total? Bingo, times 100, right, to make it a percent. You do a part divided by the total, you just get the ratio. So, but any percentage is gonna be the same overall formula, part divided by um, the total or the complete, and then times 100. So in this case, if we're talking about grades and points possible and points earned, what's part and what's total? What is it? Somebody say it louder. My ears are no good anymore. Out of, yeah, so the total points possible goes on bottom. And then the points that they earn goes on the top times 100. So we, let's try and type that in as a formula. We have 
points earned and we have points possible, right? The points possible is the 30 down here at the bottom. Points earned is right there. So hit equals, tell Excel you're gonna do some math. Click on points earned, divided by points possible. Oops. Um, multiplication is, uh, use the asterisk for multiplication when you're typing in on computers, right? Um, and it's just times 100, right? Oh, how did I do that? Speech A7. Does that look reasonable? 28 divided by 30 should be, that's more than 90%, right? So that seems like that's the right answer. So let's try copy and pasting our formula again. That didn't work. Somebody figured out what that arrow sign or what that error code is. Divided by zero. How did I divide by zero? But why did it work the first time and not the rest of them? This one worked. When I copy and pasted it though, because I'm moving everything. Whoa, whoa, don't do that. Yeah, the cells that I'm referencing moved, right? We wanted J3 to turn into J4, but we wanted J7 to stay the same. Right? So there are two approaches here. There's what I consider the brute force approach, and then there's the one that will be more helpful down the line. The brute force approach is just instead of using J7, type in 30. That would work, right? Gives me the same answer for the first one. Now when I copy and paste, I get good answers for everything, at least not divide by zero answers. But then what happens if I want to go back and add another assignment? That's going to change everything, right? Because it's not out of 30 points anymore. So the, the better way to do this is instead of just dividing by 30, We're still going to divide by J7, but we actually, there's a, there's a key, key code, secret, a secret handshake, we can call it. There's a secret handshake you can use with Excel. Tell Excel, hey, don't change this one. Leave this one where it is. Change everything else, but don't change J7. Uh, and the keyboard shortcut is for it is F4. If, I don't know if your Chromebooks have F4 on them. Um, up in the top row. Uh, if you have a full-size keyboard, it'll be there. But when you hit F4, here's Excel trying to help help me again. No, go away. It really doesn't want me to do this. All right, J7, you can type F4, but what it does when you when you hit F4 is it puts dollar signs in front of the variables that you don't wanna change. So a dollar sign followed by a variable in Excel says don't change that. So if you hit dollar, if you put a dollar sign in front of J, that says no matter what I do to copy and paste this formula, don't change that J, keep that J the same. And if we put a dollar sign in front of the seven, it tells you, okay, not only are you not gonna change the J when I copy and paste it, don't change the seven either. So now when we copy and paste, we get these answers. And if we look down the line here, we see, okay, J4 divided by J7, J5 divided by J7. The dollar signs just tell Excel, don't touch that leave it the way it is. You do need both dollar signs though for this to work. It's more powerful 
to have it require two dollar signs because that way if I'm copying and pasting the formula into an entire block of cells, I can say, okay, change J, but don't change seven. Um, or vice versa. Or I can say, don't change the cell no matter what. Keep it the same. But the easiest way to do it is to just use the dollar sign J, dollar sign seven, don't change anything. All right, so quizzes, the quiz points and quiz percent should be able to do that the same way. So I'm gonna show you one trick for doing quiz points first. When we did homework points, we just clicked on said C3 plus D3 plus E3, right? What if there were 10 assignments? We wouldn't really want to do that 10 times, right? But we can you do, we can call a function that's just equals, and then you just type the word sum. And then anytime you call a function in Excel, you start by opening parentheses, and that's where you're going to put the stuff that you want Excel to, to work on. So when you type sum and then open parentheses, it's just going to add whatever numbers you get. You could type in the numbers there by hand. You could type in 9 plus 8 plus 9 again. Um, or you can select an entire range of data points. So if I wanted to change to add up Q, quiz 1, quiz 2, and quiz 3, I can just select all three of those cells. And now when I close the parentheses and hit enter, that's just the same as typing in F3 plus G3 plus H3. But you can do it for much larger data sets as well. You could sum, you know, 100,000 cells if you wanted to. And now we should be able to copy and paste again, right? Copy, paste. sum of F3 to H3. If you're gonna put in a range of cells, use a colon, say everything from F3 to H3. And now we can do the same thing. Try doing your quiz percentage, use your dollar signs to get that, that uh, percentage to work. So Excel used to be limited to 256 columns and like a couple thousand rows. But I think it's a lot bigger now. Let's see what the online version can do. Yeah, you can get pretty large. You can get, after you run out of out of letters, it starts over with AA, AD, AC. A, so this is basically, we're almost to the end of the third alphabet. So that's going to be what, 26 to the third columns. That's a fair number of columns. Uh, and number of rows. Yeah, it's over a thousand, over a million, I mean. So it can handle a lot bigger data sets than it used to be able to when I was first learning all this stuff. Which doesn't matter that much yet. We only deal with five students and seven assignments at this point, but it'll wind up being significant later. All right, 25 over or L3 over L7, F4 times 100. Copy paste. All right, everybody with me so far? Not too tricky so far, right? Couple new tools that you're gonna have to practice before you remember them, but we'll keep using Excel in various labs and assignments in this class because um, you basically can't do anything in the sciences these days without knowing how, how uh, basic data analysis works. I mean, it always starts with spreadsheets. Um, and even not in the sciences, People use spreadsheets for everything. People use spreadsheets if you're going to be an econ major, if you're going to go into to business in any capacity. Um, if you're a restaurant owner, you might use spreadsheets to keep track of inventory and ordering habits and things like that. You can do a lot of analysis in Excel um, if you know what you're doing. And this is getting you to know the basics here.
All right, what's the next thing it has us calculate? We're supposed to do total grade, right? Final grade. All right, so here's, this is, I won't say this is necessarily a, a insider's tip or something like that, but um, when you're doing formulas in Excel, it can be really helpful sometimes to write them out the way you would normally do math on a piece of paper and then translate it from your regular math work into Excel type, right? So if we're trying to find our final grade here, um, this class, I think it tells you in the, in the assignment, right? Uh, the what the percentages are: fifty percent homework, twenty percent quizzes, thirty percent exam. I'm gonna write that down so I don't forget. So not the same, not the exact. Um distribution that we have in this class. If we wanna do a weighted average, if we wanna take the percent scores in all three of these categories and mix them together, we're not gonna do just an average, right? Because an average treats every data point like it's equal, right? Every data point is divided by the same number when you take a regular mean, right? If we want one of our data points to be worth more than the others, we're going to change what we multiply it by. So for any time you're doing a weighted average, it's going to be the weight as a decimal times the value until you get all of, until all of your weights add up to 100 or to one. Right, so you take every category is going to have the weight as a decimal times the score in that category, and then you just add the pieces up. And so if we're trying to do that for this class specifically, we can fill this in a little bit. Final grade is going to be equal to the homework percentage of that student times 0.5 for 50%. So quiz percentage then times what? 0. 0.2, bingo. It doesn't matter what order I write these in, I wrote them flipped here, but it doesn't make a difference, right? Is that the commutative property? I never remember, it's been a long time. It makes up the commutative property and the transitive property. I think transitive is addition. Either one, no? It's, it's commutative. So what is transitive? Oh, transitive is A plus B equals B. No, that's, that's the same one. Transitive is one of the other ones. I'm not a math teacher. So here's the function we're going to type into Excel. You got the final grades. 0.5 times the homework percentage for that student plus 0.2 times the quiz percentage for that student plus, plus 0.3 times the exam percentage for that student. We didn't calculate an exam percentage yet. Did we need to? Why, why or why not? If it's out, we made our exam out of 100, it's already a percentage, right? But if we did something like a midterm exam and a final exam, so there was a total of 200 points in the exam category, we would have to do an exam percentage as well. Or if you did something like make your final exam out of 120 points instead of 100 points, you just turn that into a percentage. As far as typing that in, it's not that tricky. Same thing we've been doing, 0 0.5 times homework percentage plus 0 0.2 times quiz percentage plus 0 0.3 times exam percentage now when we copy and paste there was nothing in there in that formula that, that I just wrote there was nothing that 
we wanted to keep constant so we didn't need to worry about the dollar signs, right? We get a series of final grades. Weighted averages are really, really powerful anytime you've got a bunch of data points that aren't all equally important. If you want some, if some of your data points are more likely than others, like for instance, in our weighted averages for the atomic masses, those atomic mass percentage are, are weighted averages, except instead of instead of a grade score for value, you plug in the weight of one of the isotopes. And instead of the, the weight up here, it's the, the likelihood that you find that atom in nature as a, as a decimal. So there's if you have a one in four chance of, you pick an atom at random, let's say a chlorine atom, you've got a one in four chance that it's a chlorine 35. That's backwards, a one in four chance that it's chlorine 37. Then you would put in 0.25 for the weight and 37 here. And then the other possibility was that it's chlorine 35, and that's a 75% probability. It's the same basic principle that they also use for figuring out what's called the expected value or how likely are to win if you go gambling down at the casinos. If you have five possible outcomes that are not all equally likely and they all pay out differently, if you want to know what your average outcome is going to be, you take the possibility of that outcome times how much money you make for that outcome. And you add them all up. If you get a positive number, that means that you're likely, on average, to make money. If you get a negative number, which is a lot more common, then it means on average you're going to lose money. All right, so how's this part going? Looking okay? All right, last thing to do here before we move on to the other one um, is just save it so that you can upload it to Canvas. So one thing that I uh, wanna make sure everybody gets away from is when you need to turn in something from Google Sheets or from um, online version of Word, you can't just send me the link to that file because it doesn't give me access to it just because you sent me the link. So what I want you to do anytime you're submitting an assignment is I want you to download it and then re-upload it. It's an extra step, but it makes it so I can actually see it instead of just getting a you do not have access issue. All right, so just go up to file and usually there's a save as or an export button. Um, download a copy and then you can go and upload and then go to canvas and you can click upload. The other thing you can do in this case too, since, since the other part of this assignment is also going to be in Excel, you can save it all as one file. Excel can handle lots and lots of, of um, data, right? If you go down to the bottom where you see this, it says sheet one. If you hit the plus button in the same file, in the same, they call it a book because traditionally you would actually have a bound book and on page one would be sheet one and page two would be sheet two. So you could have a whole bunch of things, spreadsheets in the same book. Um, it, within the same book, the same file, we can have as many spreadsheets as we want, based, not as many as we want, but I believe that they can handle more than anything we're going to do for this class. So you can do part the second part of this assignment um, in the same file, just by adding a sheet down here, and then go over to uh, the other files here. And this one is has a better, has a pretty good procedure and report. Um, so you're going to do the analysis in Excel, and then but you're going to answer questions in the report here. Right, so the last thing I'm going to walk you through here, I guess we did miss a few things. You forgot how to do, forgot to do the average for everything, huh? Um, so let's go back to our grade book real quick. If we want to do an average, um, average has its own function, just like 
um, just like sum has its own function, you literally can just hit equals average. And then it is trying to think for me, which I don't typically like, but it actually did it right this time. Usually when Google or Microsoft tries to think for you and auto completes your formulas, um, if you're in the sciences, it does it wrong nine times out of 10. It's Excel and sheets are built for people that are doing dealing with um, business and economics and things like that, not really for scientists. And so usually it gets it wrong. In this case, it did it right. Um, but I'm going to type it in by hand anyway. You just type average, open parentheses, and just like we did with some, you can click and drag to select them. Yeah. That, there you go. That's, there's an example of how it did it wrong. Thank you. Instead, if I want to stop it there, because that's my, I only have four students and then I have my points possible category. So I'm only going to do C3 to C6, not C3 to C7, like Excel tried to do for me. It gives me the average. It's a nice, neat number. And now also you can copy and paste sideways too. So copy that, if you copy that same formula, select all of the, all of the, let's see, there's quiz percent. So that's total. When we paste it in there, we get all of our averages. So average score in the homework percent category was 85%, 81% in quizzes. Average score on the exam was 77. Final grade average was 81%. Right, so that's a pretty that's a pretty useful tool as well. In fact, you will have a, a um, part C. Is that a sixth of your final exam will be a t two take home problems, um, one of which will be here's a bunch of data. Do some Excel with it. Calculate averages. Do find some densities. Plot some data. So this is really close to some stuff that'll be on on the take home part of the final as well. And we'll get more practice with it too. All right. Any questions on part one of the assignment? Everybody get to where I was? Um, you can do more sophisticated stats too. That's a pretty small sample size, but if I want to do something like find the median, you you also can do equals median. And find the median. Median and mean are not going to be the same, right? Um, you can find what's the first quartile for this data set if you have a whole bunch of data sets. First quartile is the point where half of or 25% of the data is below that and 75% of the data is above that. You can find the third quartile. You can find the min or the max. What's the lowest score? Who was the lowest score here? If I want to find the minimum equals min. Select my data. Again, with four data points, it's not really that worth it, right? We can look at it and see who has the lowest score. But if you have 30 data points, that's worth it because that might it's hard to find what that lowest data point is if you're just quickly scanning things. All right. Obviously, I could talk about Excel all day. So I'm going to stop. Make sure, every, is everybody caught up to that point? We're good. Moving on to making scatter plots. Want to try that? We have a few minutes, right? You're till, till 2.40? Awesome. Well, then you already finished part one of your of your uh, lab assignment for this week. This one will take a little bit longer. Where is, I want the... So all of the data for this one is in the procedure. Um, and so this, this assignment, this part of the assignment is not on doing writing calculations or formulas or doing the calculations. It says, here's the data. How do you plot it and find out things about the data um, that way? So, has anybody taken statistics? You, do you have to do a, a linear regression line by hand? 
just once, right? What did you use after that? Did they have you use TI-83 or? Yeah. So that hasn't changed since I was in high school. You get, you have to do a linear regression line by hand once, and then they get taught how to do it under TI-83. It's way easier if you have a real keyboard instead of punching it in on a TI-83, and it looks better too. Um, we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to use what's called a trend. It's called a trend line, but it's basically just doing a linear regression on the data, just like you would in stats. All right, so here's a set of data. I'll, I'm going to walk you through making a graph once, including adding a trend line. Um, and then you'll be able to work through the rest of it on your own. That The instructions are pretty good. The, this It's a slightly older assignment. So some of the buttons. So this is back from the 2016 version. So the buttons will look a little bit different. But all the commands are in more or less the same spot. If you can't find anything, just let me know. Um, there's another trick. If you don't want to enter your data by hand, which... Again, for five data points, it's not that big a deal to enter it by hand. But if you want to, if you can copy and paste your data, Excel usually does it pretty well with that. Except in this case, it puts everything, it understands how to put it into the right rows, but it doesn't know how to split it up into columns until you tell it what to do. Um, so there's actually a trick to that. You can go, when you have the data selected like this, you can go over to data and split text to columns. And it doesn't always get it right because it basically goes through and says, okay, anytime there's a space, that's supposed to be a new column, which works for our data, but not for our label. So we're just gonna have to fix the labels at the top. So, this is temperature in Kelvin. And this is going to be volume in liters. And then these ones, these extra. All right, so we, if we have data in here, here's the key. Um, is Once again, don't let Excel try to think for you. This is where Excel messes it up every time. If you try to insert a graph and your cursor, the highlighted cell, is anywhere near your data, it's going to try and make it a line graph, which on the surface might look okay. It still looks kind of like a graph like we want, but in the sciences, we always want to give it the X's and the Y's. We want to specify our X and specify our Y. We don't want Excel to think for us that way. So get your cursor away from everything. By that, I mean at least one completely empty column between your cursor and the data before you try and add any graphs. Um, and then if you go over to insert, there's a whole bunch of items for charts. You can click recommended charts, but that gives you a wizard. We don't really want that. This one that just looks like, nope, that's not right either. So if you click here and get the full one, we want, a scatter plot all the way at the bottom. A scatter plot means we're going to tell it the X's and the Y's specifically. If you try and do a line graph, it just assumes all of your data points are one X value apart instead of us specifying what the X values are. So if we do, if we insert a scatter plot, it just gives us something blank for starters, which is fine. That's what we want. When you click on it, there's a couple ways you can get here. If you go up to, to the top to get to the chart, the little green button that shows up after you click on it, you can go to select data or if you just right click and go to select data and it brings up, and depending on if you're using the downloaded version or sheets, et cetera, it'll look a little bit different. Um, it didn't bring it up at all right there. There it goes. Yeah. So go to insert. And then um, on the far right of the possibilities, click on that and it'll give you all of the options and go down to get scatter. All right. And then once you get your chart in there, your empty chart in there, you can go to select data. 
give it a second to load. Hopefully your computers are quicker than mine. Asking this thing to stream to Zoom and record and run it. The uh, online version of Excel all at the same time is asking a lot of this poor little ThinkPad. It came up a second ago. There it goes. Okay. So by default, so basically what we're going to do for starters is it says X values and Y values. We're just going to remove whatever it tries to put in there to begin with and go for our X values. We're going to go to add field. And maybe it's going to make us do Y values first. Yes, it is. So for series one, this changed a little bit. Basically, we're just going to select what we want as our Y values. And I don't know. I don't want that. There we go. So if it, by default, it tried to make it so that every row was a separate series, we don't want that. We want our every column, our columns to be separate series. And then for the X values, we're going to go add field series one. Why is it giving me such trouble with this? See, this is why I'm not a fan of the online version. I can make the downloaded version jump through hoops. Maybe I have to select both. I have to do that in the online version of Excel. Okay. So when you do your, when you select your, your data, you have to select both of these columns. And that'll give you make your X values the B and your Y values are in column C. And you'll get something that looks like this. You know if you did it right, if it's not just one, two, three across the bottom, if it shows you 200, 250, 300, 350, 400. If you're just getting one, two, three, something's not right. And you got to fiddle with it a little bit more. Um, if you want to do this, the, the so sh handles this a little bit better the online version or the download version handles it way better you go to the on the downloaded version which you can probably get to if you have if you have um through ltsd if you have the ability to one i won't run on chrome os but you can get the downloaded version of office by going through the microsoft webmail which you probably have if you have access to excel um online which, so if you can get to this point, when you're getting to Excel, if you go up to click on Microsoft 365, it'll give you an option to download the a downloadable version. Or you can go up to install and more at the top right, and it'll let you install all the apps, and then you can get the download version. That said, I don't think it'll run on a Chromebook. Um, it'll run on a Mac, it'll run on a, on a Windows PC, I don't think that it'll work on Chrome. So in Chrome, you might be stuck with the online version or using Sheets. Um, if you do it on the downloaded version, it looks much the same, except that it works a lot better. Um, but you get this kind of scary looking di um, dialog box to select your X's and Y's, but it does let you select your X's and Y's individually and a lot more carefully. You can see I get the same the same graph here that I had in the other one. The other one just took me fiddling around with options until I got it to look the way it was supposed to look. If you're not sure if it's looking the way it's supposed to look, look at the X-axis and the Y-axis. Do can you find your data points? Do they look like they're in the right spot? Is it all one series or did it try to make it into a bunch of series? If it makes it into a bunch of like if I went this option, 
if you if you did the data field split by rows instead of columns, you'll get something that looks like this. That's not what we want either, right? So play around with it till it looks something like what you expect, which is that you have the X's and the Y's. Okay. All right. Once we have the data, getting the once we have the chart, getting the trend line is actually the easy part. Um, and it's just a little bit of playing around with formatting stuff. If you played around it all with with Microsoft Word, trying to make your fonts and headers look the way you want it to look. Excel's charts work the same way, basically. Find the right options. Um, you can go and add el chart elements, add chart title, chart axes, that kind of thing. Um, or you can just right click on it to get to uh, a format box that'll allow you to play around with things. If you want to add a trend line, which is what we want in this case, you just make sure you click on it so that you get the data series highlighted. And then you're just going to right click. Nope, not on the online version. Um, so we're going to have to we're going to have to fiddle around with the menu options again. There we go. So if we want to add a trend line, maybe it's in select data now. Okay, so if you go to format, there it goes. So if you go to format, your um, so data, this is where we selected our data. If then you go to format and scroll to the bottom, you can get an option that says trend line. You can turn it on. And then it gives you some options like trend line name. Um, you can turn on the equation in values. So if you want to know what the equation for the trend line is, and what the R squared value is. That's how you can do that. Um, one quick note about this. It doesn't matter what your data looks like in this class especially, but in the sciences in general, you will only do linear trend lines. The statistics for finding a trend line, like Excel will give you the option to do a trend line that is exponential, logarithmic, moving average, polynomial, power. None of those are statistically rigorous the way that finding a linear trend line is. So we're gonna do everything in terms of linear trend lines in this class. All right, so basically forget that this option exists because it's garbage. Um, there are, there's math out there to support those, but it's not statistically as good as a best line of best fit that's linear. And if you did everything right, your number should match mine pretty careful, pretty closely. There might be a little bit of difference in the sig figs. Um, there might be off by one here or there, depending on if it, may, it might not show. Um, for sig figs, so it might do some rounding there. It might look slightly different, but overall your numbers should look pretty similar. All right, questions on making a chart? It might feel like this is not learning chemistry because it's not, but this is a very important tool for going on going forward in science. Yeah. On Google, so on Google Sheets, yeah. I can't do that one from memory. I don't know Sheets as well. Oh, 
So R squared is measure how good the data is, how linear it is. If R squared is one, that means all of your data points fit on the line perfectly. So closer to R squared, the better your data. Do you know how to put the equation on the equation? Yes. So right above where you clicked on R squared. Um, there's an option for the label. So you just have to say. So like, put there, you could use oh, the you should put the label. Oh, okay. I don't know how to make it go. <laughs> the other thing you can do to get the equation, if you want more sig figs or less sig figs, you can right click on your, on the, um, if you're in Excel, you can right click on the um, text box and tell it what format to put it in. The other thing you can do is you can actually just say equals slope. And then select your X's and Y's. So known Y's, comma, known X's, close parentheses, and it'll give you the same value. And you can do equals intercept as well. Do the same thing. Known Y's, known X's. So basically, this is just finding the equation for the line without actually plotting the line on a chart. If you want to know what the intercept and the slope are with more sig figs, you can do it do the statistics separately from making the chart because then you're not fighting with formatting stuff as much. Um, but that said, nine times out of ten, when you do this, you're going to get the chart. You're going to want the chart too. So you get your chart looking the way you want it. Find a way to add the trend line, and one of the options on the trend line is going to be display equation or show equation and show R squared. Probably even type in equals R. Yeah, equals RSQ. Let's see if that gives me the same one. Pretty close. Those are the slope and the intercept of the equation of the line. You don't have to get them from the chart. You can just say equals and then type slope. And when you open parentheses, it'll say select your y's, select your x's. So the horizontal. So you want to do something serious. If you if you do it in the in the horizontal oh. axis, you're changing the formatting. Oh. So you want to go down to go up. Actually, you want to go to setup, not press cross. So then there's your x-axis. You want to add x-axis in your a b. Your x-axis would be b three to b seven, right? If you click oh. that little box right there, it'll let you click and drag this little. Oh. We figured out how to get the x axis because then we couldn't figure out why it was left. <laughs> we have five minutes left, so if you're on sheets and you want to and you want to see how to do this on sheets real quick, if you're still working on that, I'll open up sheets. It really doesn't want to do that. Oh. It doesn't like duck, duck, go here, huh? Yeah, but accounting spreadsheets aren't real spreadsheets. I don't care what my brother says. <laughs> I said my, my mom's an accountant and my brother's an accountant, and this is an ongoing debate we have. They know how to do pivot tables and stuff, but they can't plot their data right. My mom would argue. <laughs> my mom's very sorry. I I understand that. I do. I like looking at big numbers too. Large data sets are fun. You should see my you should see my March Madness bracket. I scrape all the data from I don't watch basketball, but I scrape all the data off basketball reference and then I have a predictive algorithm that I've built up over the last 10 years. I don't even like basketball, but I like large data sets. Yeah, no, my mom 
-hmm. It's a good way to make money. It's just not. Oh. oh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's fun. All right. So in sheets, you're still going to add. You're still going to add your chart the same way. Still want it to be scatter. We just don't. We then add a series. You go to add X axis and select your X axis. Then you add your series. And when you want to click and drag to select something in sheets, you click on this little box right here. And that just tells it you're going to select it by hand. And you get something like that. One last, one last thing before the bell rings. If you get to the point where your chart looks all messed up and you can't figure out how to get back to where you were before, sometimes it's faster to delete it and start over than it is to try and fix something that got messed up some way you don't even know. Right, so don't be afraid. And control Z, train your fingers to sit on control Z on your left hand. That's the undo shortcut. Anytime you do something and then you lose all of your work, control Z and it'll come right back. So 